Hi, today we're going to be looking at this Jibun TC20B soldering station and this is a very high power system. You can see just by the size of this thing that it must have a very large power supply in it. It's rated for 380 watts and it's designed to drive all of the JBC hand pieces and in particular the large C470 type cartridges. So these types of things here where they've got a huge amount of thermal mass and these are designed more for soldering things like lugs onto wires rather than PCB level rework. Although there are smaller cartridges for where you've got really heavy ground planes and you need to solder something onto it. Um, now this thing is pretty much only available from Jibun themselves. However, the availability seems to be a little bit mixed. I only bought this one around a month ago. At the moment it's saying it's not available on AliExpress, but I've seen it saying that and then they've become available again. Uh, so if you're interested in one of these, you might just want to keep an eye on the AliExpress page and see if it becomes available again. This video is sponsored by PCB, where your one-stop shop for all things manufacturing and prototyping related. And today I wanted to highlight a few offers that are present on the website. So there's a $29 offer for your SMT orders. This allows you to get your PCBs manufactured and components assembled onto the PCB and included in that cost is the free shipping and the cost of the stencil used for the assembly. And then they've also got an offer on flexible PCBs. So up to 60% off on one to two layers or four layer PCBs. And if you go to the PCB instant quote and select FPC or rigid flex, you can select from the various options on here, but to get the special pricing, either pick the one layer, two layer or four layer option and you'll get a discount when you add the item to your basket. So don't forget to visit PCB Way. What we've got on the bench is what came in the kit. So I've got a handpiece which is designed to hold either C245 or C470 cartridges. We've got the control unit itself. We have one of these cradles as well as a little cable here which can connect this to the base station to enable auto sleep. And then we also got two cartridges. Now in the listing it said we'd get a C245 and a C470 cartridge. It looks like we've got two C470 cartridges here. Here's the handpiece and I think this is just a standard T245 handpiece and the actual cartridge dimensions are the same for the C245 and C470 cartridges so there's nothing special here. Um, I might have expected the cable to be potentially thicker if we're trying to deliver 380 watts to the cartridge but this is just a standard handpiece just with a slightly different connector, one of the older style connectors that we used to see on these types of soldering stations. Here's the cradle for the unit and it has the nice holder here for the iron itself but the rest is quite basic, just folded sheet metal. We've got a connector here which you can push the 4mm banana jack into and that's for the auto sleep uh, but the rest is pretty basic so we've just got a sponge at the front, some brass wool and then some sticky rubber pads on the bottom just to hold it in place. So certainly functional, but not the highest quality piece of equipment. Here's the large C470 cartridges. These ones are G Boon branded ones, and they've got loads of thermal mass up at this end. So the idea really is that when you apply this to the solder joint, you can dump a whole load of heat into it using the thermal mass in the cartridge, and then the control loop has time to deliver power to the heater itself to continue delivering that power to the solder joint. But these are actually very heavy. Uh, there's loads of metal here. And this first one here is about 15 millimeters across here. And then this one is more like 10 or 11 millimeters. I have also got a genuine JBC 470 cartridge just here. Uh, so that's what one looks like direct from JBC. And I think this one's a five millimeter cartridge which is a little bit more designed for PCB type use if you need to deliver loads of power into a ground plane or something like that. And then here's the control unit. So I think this has got a colour TFT on the front just here, so a nice graphical display, a USB port for firmware updates, and then a rotary encoder with a push button for changing the settings. So this all looks very similar to those T12 type soldering stations that we used to look at a lot. The only difference really is the depth on this thing is absolutely huge. If we have a look at the measurements, it's about 220 millimeters long or nearly nine inches. So really quite big in comparison. The ones that we normally see are about half of that. And then at the back here, we've got the IEC connector with a mains power switch on the back, a fuse, connector for the tool, and then this is the connector that goes off to the stand to enable the sleep mode. And then we've got a ground for ESD protection. 
Here's what it looks like with the cover off. And the first thing that we can notice is that we've got two power supplies here. So these, we've got the mains coming in at the back and we've got a mains connection to both of these power supplies. And then the outputs of these seem to go to the front panel board over here. And at first glance, I do notice there's a relay just here. So I wonder if just one is used when we're using a T245 cartridge and then they're put into series for the larger C470 cartridge, but we'll have a look at the front panel board in a moment. Uh, one thing to note is the earthing, as usual on these things, is pretty poor. So we've got an earth connection from the IEC connector to this little PCB at the back here. It goes directly to the ground terminal, and it also goes to one of the pins on the connector, which is presumably to earth the cartridge, uh, but that's done through a one ohm resistor. But the actual chassis of this thing isn't very well earthed, and Potentially with this arrangement, it might suffer from the issue that the Ericsson stations have where if you happen to solder onto something that's connected to mains earth, it might cause the readings to be false on here and start heating up the cartridge higher than it's supposed to. But we can look at that again later. At first glance, it looks like we've got two identical power supplies. So these are the feedback components just here. If we take a note of those values, it looks to be exactly the same as on this one here. So I think these are two 24 volt power supplies. And then when we look at the front panel board where these wires connect to, it says 24 volts just here and then 48 volts. So yeah, like I said, I think this relay is switching in a second power supply to connect it in series so that we can drive the high power C470 cartridge. And yeah, just quickly, if we test between the two power supplies, you can see that they're not paralleled up or anything like that. So it makes sense for these to be switched in and out for the two supply rails for the different types of cartridges. Here's the front panel PCB and it's fairly straightforward, there's nothing too complicated on here. So the main device in the middle here is the microcontroller that runs the LCD and runs all the control loops and everything. So a GD32F303 ARM microcontroller. Then at the bottom left here we've got the USB connector, so this has a USB interface on it as well. We've got a little piezo buzzer. And then we've got some power supply, so a little DC to DC converter up here, which will give us our 3.3 volts for the microcontroller. We've got some analog electronics here for conditioning the thermocouple output, and then that will feed it into the ADC on the microcontroller. We've got a Hall effect current sensor, which is measuring the current into the heater. And then we've got a large MOSFET here. So this is an HYG200P10, and this one is rated for up to 80 amps at 100 volts. Now this one does actually have a little sill pad. You can see a little bit of blue on the back of the TOT20 package. There's a little pad which sits on the chassis, although there's no actual bolt holding this down in place. It's just providing a little bit of extra heat sinking. This, uh, because we're running it from DC, we actually have to do hard switching of the power into the heating element. There's no zero crossing switching, so this will get warm compared to a system where we're running the heating element with AC. Then we've got the connector over here that goes to the back panel for the iron. So most of these pins are for the heating element, but there's also the sleep pin on here as well. And then we've got this relay, which is used for switching in and out the two power supplies. I've just added an extra earth wire that will go through this screw and onto the top part of the chassis. So certainly better than what they had before, but still not quite ideal. These cases aren't very good for mains powered equipment because there's no real dedicated way to attach an earth bond to all of the parts of the chassis to make sure it remains safe. Let's take a look at the user interface. So at the moment there's no handpiece connected, so it says no tool, but let's go into the menu. So we hold down the rotary encoder and we've got four menu items. We'll go to station first of all. And the first two items are just minimum and maximum temperature. So these are limits that you can impose on the GUI so that you can't accidentally turn the temperature outside of the range that you've set here. But the station actually supports going up to 480 degrees C. However, most of the time you'll never need temperatures above 420. Same with the minimum temperature. And then we've got the step size. So when you turn the rotary encoder, how quickly the temperature adjusts. This one's currently set to five degree steps, but you can change this to whatever you like. Minimum input voltage. Now, I think this is more to do with when you have one of these stations that doesn't have the built-in power supply. So at the moment, this one just says 9 volts. But basically, when the front panel PCB detects the power supply has dropped below 9 volts, then it will turn off the output. We've got the peak power here, which is 380 watts, but we can adjust this again should we wish to. The theme, which is either the default or graphics. So there is a mode where you can just have the 
text on the front panel, so the temperature uh, with large digits, or you can plot it on a graph. Um, I think this is to do with when the handpiece is in the cradle. There is no instruction manual for this, but I think basically um, when you take it out of the cradle, it says it will exit the sleep. We've got the buzzer volume. Now, it's actually un quite unobtrusive. It's not an annoying piezo buzzer, so I'm going to keep this as it is. We've got LCD brightness, language. So just English and simplified Chinese. Temperature lock so that you can prevent people adjusting the temperature. And then just a pin, which allows you to lock the unit so that people can't change any of the settings. All right, we've got a handpiece connected now. So let's turn on the station and see what changes. And it's just run up to the sleep temperature, about 160 degrees. And if we take the handpiece out the cradle, yeah, we see some really high powers there, 360 watts or so. And we've got some smoke coming off the cartridge now, so certainly up to temperature there. We can adjust the temperature with the rotary encoder just here. And we've also got some presets that we can scroll between by pressing the encoder. So 350, 260 and 310. And to change those presets, We've got a new menu item that says tools once we connect the handpiece. So it's detected we've got the C470 and we can set some settings specific to the, specifically to that handpiece. So the sleep temperature, the time between going to sleep and shutdown mode and the sleep mode as well. And there's three options here. So sleep base, this is when the handpiece is in the base, it knows to put it into sleep mode, but we can also change it to PDST which is where it checks the amount of power being delivered. And if it doesn't see any spikes above a certain level, uh, that assumes that you're not soldering anymore and it can put it to sleep. And if you have one that's enabled, this handpiece doesn't have it. You can also use a handpiece that has a vibration detector, which can be used to put it into sleep. Then we've got temperature level. And these are basically those presets that we saw on the front screen. So we'll set these to 320. 350 and 375 which are quite reasonable values and then to go back we hold the encoder we've got calibration options now so offset temperature as well as the multi-point calibration we can adjust the PID loop and then we've also got some settings here so DTC and PDST so these are enabling us to uh, change the settings for the power level when it decides that it's going to go into sleep mode. So if we're going to here, uh, basically, if we see a power, a continuous power of 20 watts being delivered to the iron and nothing more, it assumes it's not done any soldering, and then it can go into sleep mode. So that's what it looks like. And if we enable the graphing, you can see on here, if I take the handpiece out the cradle, then we've got a real time graph of what's going on. Now you can see actually there's a bit of oscillation going on. So the PID loop could do with some tuning here. And then we put it back in the cradle and it goes into sleep mode. So certainly some tweaking that could be done. It's quite nice that we've got access to that PID loop. Uh, that's something that's normally hidden in a lot of these stations. Let's have a look at the calibration. Although really if you're using one of these stations, you're really doing it for raw power rather than temperature accuracy. Uh, but let's tin the tip for the first time. Give it a quick brush in some brass wool and see how we're doing. We've got it set to 350. And we're not actually that far off, about five degrees off or so. Uh, maybe getting closer. Yeah, one or two degrees off. So that's really good. Uh, that's one of these cartridges here. Let's have a go at seeing what it's like with some power delivery into a PCB. We've got a four layer PCB here. Let's see what happens. And no problems whatsoever here. In fact, it's quite difficult to put down the amount of power that this thing is capable of delivering into the iron. Perhaps we'll try moving on to a piece of copper instead.
We've got some meter tails here. These again are 25 millimeters squared. Let's see if we can heat this up. And yeah, we're just feeding solder in as fast as it will take it, basically. Could do with something to compress the strands together. And again, we're not really showing the full capability of the iron because it only seems to be drawing about 70 watts from the mains here. We're feeding in loads of solder, so it's heated all this cable up here. You can see we're feeding it in from the top side, so we've heated this whole bundle. How about if we wanted to solder onto some copper buzz bar? Let's see how well it handles this. So a bit of solder on the bottom to get the flow going. Pretty amazing stuff really. I think this might be the first one that outperforms the Metcal. I haven't got the power meter hooked up to it, but here is the Metcal with the large power delivery tip here. And although this does heat up this copper bar, it doesn't quite have the same performance as that huge tip with all of that power behind it. I suspect these 2p coins are like child's play here. And so I think this is the first soldering iron that has effortlessly outperformed the Metcal systems, although I have got a special handpiece and cartridge for the Metcal which may bring that back into the lead once again. But in terms of raw power and soldering performance, this so far is one of the best that we've seen. And one can assume that if you bought the genuine JBC uh, high power station, I think it's the HDE system, which is retailing for quite silly money at the moment, then we probably get the same performance out of that. But yeah, really high power delivery system here. Possibly um, not the best control unit, it could do with some updates to improve the electrical safety. As again, with all of these types of systems, all of the performance really is down to these cartridges from JBC, or in fact, in this case, the clones from Jiboon. But this is a really nice system if you're able to get hold of it. As I said, the availability is a little bit sketchy. I think this only cost me about £100 delivered, but it seems to go on and off sale. And at the moment, it doesn't look like it's available. But I put a link to the item in the description down below if you're interested in taking a look. And if you keep an eye on it, you might notice some stock appearing every so often. But anyway, I hope you found the video useful. If you've got any thoughts or comments, don't forget to leave them in the comments section down below. Don't forget to visit our sponsor for this video, PCBWay. And until next time, thanks for watching.